All right, well, hey, everybody, thanks for coming out. Last uh, talk of the first day. Everyone have a good time at DEF CON so far? Yeah? All right, cool. Um, so great, thanks, thanks for coming out. My name is Eric Smith, and I am the uh, Assistant Director for Information Security and Networking at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. And with me today, but not on stage, is uh, Dr. Shannon Dardan. Stand up, say hi. She is the uh, Assistant Professor of Information Systems at Susquehanna University, um, just down the street from us in uh, Pennsylvania. So we're gonna talk to you today about medical identity theft. So here's the agenda for our talk. We're gonna give a little bit of background, talk about what is medical identity theft and what's actually going on in the world of medical identity theft. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about HIPAA and how HIPAA is designed to stop what's going on, even though it's not actually stopping what's going on. And then we'll look at uh, what we can do to fix it, okay? So let's get started, talk a little bit about the background. So what is medical identity theft? What is an electronic medical record? Well, here's a typical example of something that your doctor is probably already using. This is an electronic protect the health information system, electronic medical record system. And uh, this is just a, a picture we found out at Wikipedia. That's pretty uh, typical of what uh, nurses and doctors and whatnot are using today. And basically it stores all of your medical records in some easy to use way that non-technical people such as doctors and nurses and you know, billing managers and whatnot at your hospital can have full access to your medical record. So things it contains are, you know, comments about your medical record itself, your lab results, lab tests, that sort of thing. Pretty much everything about you that the hospital or the doctor knows is being stored electronically in a system like this. Okay. What's interesting is that these systems are also storing your billing information. So it knows your home address, so we know your phone number, your social security number, your health insurance information. It's all in here. So how many people are using these? Um, unfortunately, the latest statistics we could find for this were from 2006, but it, it gives you a good idea. Um, in 2006, 29.2% of all physicians were using electronic medical record systems, and 25.9% of all practices were using them. So um, within the last two years, it's certainly gone up. It's about 10% increase per year. And the reason for this is obvious. It's a cost savings for the, for the hospitals to do this. They don't have to go pull paper records to, to find out what shots you need or, or, or what's wrong with you. So it's, it's uh, financially beneficial for your healthcare provider to use an electronic medical record. So what is medical identity theft? Well, you've probably all figured out what medical identity theft is. It's like financial, financial identity theft, except someone's stealing your medical identity. So somebody wants to go to the doctor and they don't have health insurance, or somebody wants to go and get a prescription for Oxycontin, but they don't want it on their record. Or somebody needs to go get treated because they can't live, lift 50 pounds, and their job requirement as a laser printer technician says you have to be able to lift 50 pounds. There's something that you know, they want to be, that a person may want to have kept out of their medical record that may affect their ability to get or keep a job. So these are some of the reasons uh, uh, that people might be doing medical identity theft. And we'll talk a little bit more of that here in a slide. All right, so you're a victim of medical identity theft. Someone's come along and stolen your medical identity. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people say, well, I don't care, I have insurance, it's, it's not my money. Well, it turns out it, it really can affect you and it really can ruin your life. And here are just a few examples of, of why this is a horribly bad thing. Um, you could receive the wrong medical treatment. If somebody pulls up your medical record and there's an entry in there saying, well, you were seen last week for problem X and it, and it was somebody else, that could definitely affect the kind of treatment that you get. You could find that when you actually need to use your own insurance that you've, you've run out your copay for the year and, and you're, you're no longer covered for your actual symptoms. So someone else has you know, used your insurance up and, and you have nothing left for yourself. Uh, like I mentioned with the laser printer, that's just one typical example, but um, if there's items in your medical history that could affect your ability to get or keep your job, you know, the results of a drug test, for example, obviously that's going to be a problem for you. Um, same sort of thing could cause you to fail a physical. If somebody looks in your medical record and says, well, you have poor eyesight and your job is to drive a forklift or something like that, that might affect your ability to keep your job um, based on failing a physical exam. And of course, there's a the financial aspect of it all. Um, you're going to get billed for copays. You're going to get billed for uh, anything that the insurance doesn't cover that someone who's stolen your medical identity has received. 
So we've kind of already gone over this. So why would somebody want to steal your medical identity? Well, most of what's going on today, most of the actual medical identity theft cases are as a mechanism to get the financial identity theft. I mentioned early that, earlier that the electronic health records contain not only your medical information, but your financial information, your billing information. So um, a lot of the medical identity theft cases now where people are stealing medical records, that's being done simply to get credit cards and open credit in your name based on the billing side of those records. So again, you know, you could act access to health care and health insurance. You can access narcotics. You can go to the doctor. Convince them that you need some sort of, you know, uh, prescription drug that is hard to get on the street or you might be getting it just to sell it, that sort of thing. And again, covering up health records and hiding things that you don't want to have in your permanent record that might follow you around. What's really interesting is that the identity theft perpetrators are taking note to this and, and realize that healthcare facilities are really prime juicy targets for identity theft. Not only medical identity theft, but also financial medical theft. Um, here's a quote from the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society to address this. It basically, it says that the data stored in hospitals and healthcare facilities contains more data in one record than any other source. So instead of going after a bank or going after a school, we go after your medical record because we're going to get all of your financial information, all of your medical information, and, this is, and these records are stored in institutions that typically haven't been targeted for this sort of thing. Banks know that people are coming after you. Hospitals, maybe not so much. So is this, is this real? Is this actually happening, or am I just making this up so I could talk at DEF CON? Well, it, it is actually happening. So here are some numbers. Um, this is, these are from the uh, Identity Theft Resource Council. So in 2007, um, they estimate that um, these are the breaches that they know about. So obviously there's a lot of breaches that happen that get covered up. But these are the ones that have been published. So 2007, there were 65, about 4 million records exposed. And so far in 2008, there were 59 breaches and about 6 million records exposed. Now these are not necessarily malicious attacks. A lot of these are stolen backup tapes, letters sent to people with the wrong addresses on them, that sort of thing. But there are some actual malicious attacks going on here as well. Yeah? I do not know. I'd have to check the file. Okay. Well, then I would probably say no, it doesn't contain that. <laughs> So, you know, do the math. This number is, is based on up to August 1st. So if the trend continues by the end of the year, we're looking at about 8 million medical, medical records lost. Yes, I should. How much does the recipient of the identity theft have to do? Almost none. A lot of this is, is things like backup tapes were stolen, um, printed, printed records were, you know, were stored in a, uh, in a storage facility, and then they forgot to they forgot to renew the, the lease and uh, it got sold at an auction, that sort of thing. Most of it is just sort of sloppiness in the care of the healthcare provider now. Okay, so I think we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about where this, is, with, where this is trending. But so far, a lot of this is just sloppiness in the, on the side of the healthcare provider. Oh, we're gonna talk to HIPAA to death, trust me. So everyone's been to the doctor, they've given you one of these. Everyone's gotten one of these, right? This is the warm and fuzzy, we care about your privacy document that they're required to give you. And I, the doctor here, he looks really happy. He's, he's confident that they're taking good care of your medical records. And uh, we'll see that that may not actually be the case. Question? <laughs> I, I, can, I can tell you based on my own empirical, empirical study of one data point of me, I, I read mine, but so I would say 100%. Then. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's HIPAA, and this is HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of '96. Okay, it's 2008, so this is kind of old, but this covers a, a wide range of issues related to the electronic processing of medical records and billing information. So since we only have an hour today, we're going to really zoom in and just focus on one tiny little subsection of this. 
we're going to focus on the technical safeguards under the security section under the administrative simplification section of Title II of HIPAA. So if, if it's not clear that this thing did not come from our government, then you know, there you go. So like I said, we're going to focus on just the technical safeguards and, and see where we're at. Okay, so moving on in our agenda, we're looking at Section 2, HIPAA security requirements. So this is the entire text of HIPAA that relates to the technical measures that must be taken by a healthcare provider to protect your medical identity. It's about a half a page double-spaced. Okay. Give this in comparison. Anyone here, you know, work with PCI compliance? Probably a lot of people. Yeah, that's 17 pages. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, does, does, the, does that include the cover sheet? So, no, there is no cover sheet on the HIPAA section, so okay, it's, okay, we'll, we'll say it's 16 pages. Thank you. But it's still considerably more detailed than what we would find in HIPAA. So let's compare HIPAA to, P to PCI while we're on the topic, and what are the penalties for not being in compliance with the rules? And we'll talk about the rules here in a minute, but I just wanted to, to frame this and compare HIPAA versus PCI. So what are the differences between failing to comply with securing medical records to failing to comply with securing credit card information? So under HIPAA, if an entity is blatantly out of compliance on a requirement, they're fined $100. And if they don't fix it, they can be fined $100 over and over up to a maximum of $25,000 a year. Okay. Under PCI, uh, PCI is not a government standard. It's uh, negotiated with the uh, credit card companies themselves. And the fines can vary based on your own merchant agreement with the credit card companies. But the fines can be huge and can be assessed monthly, basically trying to force you to get into compliance. It's $100 every time they catch you doing something, maximum of $25,000 a year if you keep doing that same thing. Say, for example, one of the requirements under HIPAA, and we'll get to this, is that everybody who accesses a medical record has a unique username and password. Okay? Say there's a hospital somewhere that has a terminal that's logged in 24-7 and all the nurses use it, and somebody complains and they get cited. Every time they complain, somebody complains, they have to pay the $100 up to a maximum of $25,000 a year. So obviously, in a lot of these cases, it's going to be cheaper to pay the fine than to fix it. That's, that's true, right. Yeah. Okay. Can, you stand, can you speak up, please? Well, when it defines a person, a person, an entity can be a person. Yeah, there's actually a definition of a person in the HIPAA language, it's a government document, so we have to define person. Okay, so here's a table. This is basically just the distillation of the half-page technical requirements, and we're going to run through this a little bit. But what's interesting to note is that of all of these technical requirements in HIPAA, they're not even all required. There's requirements that are not required. So we're going to look at these, and the R's are required and the A's are addressable. And we're going to talk about what that means here in a second. So let's just look at the required ones first. Here are the required implementation specifics. And you'll notice that half of them have no implementation details. It says you have to do this, but we're not going to tell you anything about it. So one of them is unique user identification. So basically, what um, we looked at HIPAA. We, we talked about the half-page document. And then there was a series in the Federal Register that went into more detail because people were saying, well, you know, you gave me a half a sentence. What does that mean? So they elaborated on a lot of these points in that document, and that's where this information comes from. So, for example, for unique user identification, um, basically it says that um, an entity can use any appropriate access control mechanism that's allowed. Um, and they gave some ideas. Basically what it comes down to is that if you're a hospital, you can come up with whatever you want for unique user identification. You can have single-digit single usernames, fine. You can have that sort of thing as long as everyone has their own. Um, in the initial draft of HIPAA, it required things like, you know, key fobs and, you know, uh, multi-factor authentication. But people complained, so they took it out. There's a requirement for emergency access. Basically what this means is we need to get into your medical record. All the nurses are on vacation. What do we do? 
but it doesn't tell you anything about how you do this. So it's completely up to the hospital, and I'm, I keep saying hospital, uh, it's any medical institution, but we're just gonna, I'm just gonna use hospital, any medical institution to do this. Um, just has to come up with some policy, and that policy could be, okay, we wrote the root password of the server in Sharpie marker under the keyboard. <laughs> and that would be perfectly acceptable in HIPAA. You just have to document that as your procedure. <laughs> and I don't suggest using Sharpie because if you change it, you have to cross it out. You might want to use Post-it note. <laughs> Another requirement is the audit control. So, so the initial draft was really looking to say, okay, who's accessing these medical records, when and why? Completely got taken out, and it's up to the uh, entity to determine what sort of audit controls, if any, are required. So there's no specifics about how long we have to keep logs, what kind of logs we have to keep. It just says you need to have some sort of audit controls, write down what they are, good to go. And that's HIPAA compliant. And then person or entity authentic authentication. Um, person or entity meaning an employee or a business partner, that sort of thing. There must be some system in place to identify who they are. And the initial draft of this had lots of language in about you know, using multi-factor authentication, certificates, whatnot. People complained, so they didn't want to do that. So they basically said, okay, well, it actually says whatever is reasonable and appropriate is fine. So you, again, come up with whatever you think, um, and you're in. So if you want to just assign usernames and passwords, that's completely sufficient under HIPAA, and that's mo what most people are doing. Well, actually, most well, most of what happened was they had the initial draft of HIPAA out. Oh, he said, where did most of the complaints come from? And he just asked if they came from the AMA. And actually, no, it was mostly just individual entities, doctors, hospitals, that sort of thing. They opened it up for public review. They collected, it was like 2,600 comments. They distilled them down into a bunch of categories. There are many similar questions. And basically, if enough people said, we don't want to do X, what they did was said, uh, all right, you don't do that, and they took it out. So those are, those were the required uh, implementation specifics, and you can see that the required ones have, have really have no teeth. Um, and it gets even better because there are more that aren't even required, and these are the ones that you would think are really important, like encryption, totally not required. So what does it mean to be addressable? It basically means you should probably do this but if you don't, that's okay. Just write down why you can't do it. So let's talk about encryption. This is one of my favorites. So in the Federal Register, it asks, there are a lot of questions in the initial review about encryption. People were asking, what sort of encryption strength should we use? Where should we use encryption? Why should we use encryption? So at the end of the day, what it came down to, they actually said that the use of encryption in the transmission process is an addressable implementation specif specification, meaning you don't actually have to do it. Um, so covered entities, you know, so your hospital, your healthcare provider, are encouraged to consider the use of encryption for transmitting your EPHI over the internet. So they don't even have to encrypt your medical information when it's sent over the internet. Plain text FTP, fine. So long as they have an item written down somewhere that says, we can't do this because our system doesn't support it. Fine. HIPAA compliant. No. There are, there are absolutely no spe specifications of what type, what level, what kind of encryption needs to be used. It just says encryption. And they actually went on to say that they didn't want to specify details because certain entities may not be able to do SSL. What if this entity wants to do ROT13? You know, that's encryption. That's fine. The question was, what about doctors keeping their lab results on Blackberries? Um, in essence, in the current version of the law, you could do whatever you want so long as you write something up to justify what you're doing. So if you said, well, Blackberry, it's not a system we don't own, we don't own the back end to it, it's a third party, and they've assured us that you know they're using encryption and the data is safe, you're fine. So if something was to happen, as long as they said they had a document like that in place, they, they couldn't be cited for that. Data integrity, this is another great one. The initial version of the draft talked about data integrity. This is uh, really addressing things like you know, database journaling to make sure no one's coming in on the back end and mucking with your medical records. 
Again, people complained, so what they turned it into was that if you use things like CRC32 or you know, a checksum on your file system, that's good enough. So it really took out any sort of malicious attack vector and just turned it into random data corruption. And it kind of took all the teeth out of it. So as you can see, one of the big issues with HIPAA is that it's really up to the healthcare provider to determine what it means to be HIPAA compliant. They can come up with whatever they want and it's HIPAA compliant. Um, and so here's a quote from the Healthcare Information Management System Society again. And they have lots of uh, good information. And basically says that you know it allows the healthcare provider the latitude to do whatever they want and say it's compliant and that's good enough. So there's HIPAA. Um, in a nutshell, just the technical specifications. There's lots, lots more, but we only have an hour. So uh, just focusing on the technical specifications, we were curious, what, what does it really mean in the real world? What does it mean to have a healthcare provider be HIPAA compliant, have an actual, there's you know, companies out there that are coming in and doing audits to say, yes, you're HIPAA compliant. Um, so we, we had an agreement with a healthcare provider to come in and do a penetration test right after they had a HIPAA compliance audit done. So they got you know, high marks, it's a really high class place, um, doing a really good job, and so they contracted with, uh, with us for a penetration test. And so we went in and we decided to see what could happen. So I think it was 23 minutes that it took us to completely dump their database, something like that. So we were able to completely pull all their medical records, HIPAA compliant, and everything that we did during this penetration test we never used a vector that was there because of them being out of compliance. Everything that they did was HIPAA compliant, and yet we're still able to get in and dump everything out. Yes. The, que the question was, how do we do the penetration test? And I, I can't talk about that. The question was, could you speak as to whether a hacker could have gotten the information? Well, I could have put on my black hat that day and had been a hacker. So I, I got the information. So. Okay. I'm sorry? I have no idea. Any ideas, guys? No. I, he asked about HIPAA 2. I'm not familiar with HIPAA 2. So it's, it's, is it a draft? Yeah. I'd have to look at it. But it's, it's not anything that's in place right now, so we didn't look at that. Gonna move on, okay. So we decided to, to summarize what we found into uh, a couple of slides here to talk about some really common attack vectors that are completely permitted by HIPAA. Things that HIPAA says you're good to go, but are really common in a lot of medical institutions. So I wanna talk about that here today. And I wanna talk about a new kind of wireless attack. And everyone here has heard, you know, all these boring talks about various wireless attacks. Sorry, I shouldn't say boring, they're, they're very exciting. but. Um, a different twist on a wireless attack, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. So, um, hospital networks. What's special about a hospital network? Well, hospitals are open to the public. You can walk in off the street 24 hours a day. Okay, the security staff at a hospital are used to random people coming in off the street 24 hours a day. People are coming in because they're sick. People are coming in to visit. People are in the hospital, what have you. So they're used to having random people mulling about. And recently, because most hospitals are putting in wireless networks, which have an SSID for the public use, for patient use or for visitor use or whatnot, it's pretty common these days to walk in and see somebody sitting in the ER waiting room on their laptop, you know, updating their MySpace profile, whatever. So it's pretty easy to, to come into a hospital, sit down and blend in and, and see what you can find. Okay. So physical attacks against wireless networks, that's what we're gonna talk about now. So we're gonna look at a couple of different standard wireless network implementations. I'm guessing a lot of you are you know, dealing with one or both of these types of networks on a day-to-day -day basis. So first we're gonna talk about the old style decentralized wireless network. And uh, I'm gonna talk about Cisco stuff because th that's what I use. Uh, but this applies to Aruba or whoever else you might be using. So in a decentralized wireless network, the access points themselves are the devices that make the decisions about who gets on the network and what network they get on and what types of encryption are used and what kind of authentication is used. So a wireless client comes along. Here's a pretty typical example of what you'd find in a hospital. There's an SSID for the doctors and the nurses to use with their laptops or PDAs. 
that has access into the core, access into the, the juicy back end. There's often a wireless voice network for VoIP phones. And like I said earlier, there's often a, a network for guests. Because the access points themselves are the ones making the decisions about who gets on the network and how they get on, they have to have access to those networks at the access point. So how is this done? Usually done with an 802.1Q trunk right into the access point. So you have a bunch of access points. They're all trunked. They're all out there. So what happens if you have a facility where your access points are sort of out in the public and you can just walk up to one of them? Well, an attacker can tap into the uplink of one of these access points, establish an 802.1Q trunk into the network itself, establish the correct VLAN interfaces on their machine, start launching attacks. So now you've effectively, for example, say we're getting on VLAN 100 right here. Where's my mouse? Uh, which is using ETLS, and we've issued you know, certificates to both ends, you know, top shelf wireless encryption. We totally bypass it by just plugging into the uplink to an access point. So now we're in. We can attack the wireless clients. We could attack the access points themselves. We could attack the network infrastructure. And we can, of course, go after the back end. So how hard is this to do, realistically? You know, you're thinking of your own networks now. You're thinking of where your access points are hanging up. You're thinking, OK, I would notice if somebody did this. I would notice if somebody plugged into one of my access points. Um, but we walked around a number of institutions and found pretty much this in every place. You go down, take the elevator down to like lower level two, maintenance where they're washing the sheets or something like that. And uh, there's some access point just in some random hallway. Um, nobody around, nobody watching you. And you can plug right into it and, and do your thing. So this totally works. OK, I'm going to talk about centralized networking. And this centralized wireless networks, for example, LWAP. How many people here using some sort of centralized network LWAP system? A lot? Hands? Nobody? One guy. OK, great. Um, in an LWAP centralized network, basically what happens is that the 802.1Q trunk goes to a centralized controller in the back room somewhere, in your machine room. And then what happens is each of the access points is connected to the network using a regular access VLAN. So they boot up, and what they do is they tunnel the traffic from the wireless clients the whole way back to the wireless LAN controller. So this sounds great. This is, this is much better. Um, you don't have to have trunks to the access points. You can just have access VLANs. You can ACL this off so the only thing that that network can get to is the wireless LAN controller. You have a lot more security options available to you than you did before. But you can still do all sorts of nasty things. So what happens if we tap into this? Okay, we're going to tap in. We're going to connect our machine to this uplinked port. We're going to get on the network. And in this scenario, what we're going to do is we're going to launch an ARP spoof attack against all the access points in this VLAN. Typically, when this is deployed, you have a wireless access point VLAN. You put a bunch of APs in it. They're all available on that VLAN. So we can redirect the traffic from the, with the wireless access points through our machine, dump it off the disk, and uh, play around with it later. But I said earlier that it's tunneled, so it's not terribly useful in its native form. So this is what, this is what the data looks like if you open it up in Wireshark. Um, Wireshark correctly identifies it as, as wireless LWAP packets, but it doesn't really, you can't really do anything with it. Um, you can't run it through DSNF or anything like that because it's not native packets. It's LWAP packets with the data encapsulated in the end. Um, so that's boring. So here's the complete text of a Perl script I wrote to take that file and turn it into a regular PCAP file. So you can grab the LWAP packets on the back end, run through this script, get your regular PCAP on the other side, and now you actually have a PCAP of anything that the wireless clients were doing. So now if you want to copy this script, you can download the PowerPoint and copy and paste right there. So I'm going to show you how this works with a uh, voice over IP demo. And hopefully this works. So I just have a few uh, PCAPs here that we're going to look at. So this is going to look a lot like the uh, screenshot that you saw earlier. 
Wireshark being very cool, it knows what all these are, it sees them as IEEE packets. But again, you can't really do anything with them. You can't do any, any sort of uh, forensics on these directly. You can't use any other PCAP tools on them. It's, it's kind of anticlimactic. So what happens when we run it through, through the uh, decryption, the decoder script, I apologize for saying decryption because it's not encrypted, it's just encapsulated. So we run it through the script, turns it into regular old PCAP files. So now we have direct packet dumps of whatever the wireless client was doing. In this case, it was a wireless IP phone that we grabbed the data from. Scroll down here to the bottom, we'll see. And there are other clients associated on here at the same time. You see some random broadcasts and whatnot. Um, uh, Wireshark being very cool, it knows all about uh, RTP. So we can um, ask it to analyze that for us. And if anybody was at our ShmooCon presentation last year, you've, you've already seen this. We did this when we were talking about attacking Vonage adapters. So apologies if this is the second time for some of you seeing this. So like I said, Wireshark is, is very cool. Can uh, pull these audio streams out. And we can save the uh, payload out. And hopefully this works. Hospital operator, how may I direct your call? Okay, so just an example of your ability to completely intercept any data that's going on on the wireless side that you've now been able to bypass. If it's wireless phone, it's probably Leap. You've been able to bypass Leap just by tapping into the AP. Question? You can't do GRE tunnels from an LWAP access point. But if you're doing if you're doing Wisem and you're booting up your APs in, in native LWAP, you don't have that option. It's it's LWAP. That's what you get. Yeah. So so to do what you're saying, you basically have to put another device between the between the AP and the network, and then on the on the back end do the same thing again. So I mean that's typically done if you have a remote office and you want to put up an access point. You'd have a point to point VPN solution in place, so you couldn't capture these off the internet in that scenario. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this live, and this is just sort of asking for trouble. We're going to give it a shot because I need to, to do some stuff on wireless, and, and you guys are probably like going to deauthenticate me, but we're going to try it. So, so here's what we're going to try. I have a, a test rig set up here on the on the bench top that gives me a tunnel from the the con network back to the wireless LAN controller that I've set up in my office back in Pennsylvania, and there's an, uh, an AP set up here. That AP is booted, doing LWAP the whole way back through the tunnel to the wireless LAN controller back in my office at Bucknell. And basically what we're going to do is do an automated R spoof attack against this AP, try to collect the packets, and then while that's running, we're going to go log into an ERP system, do some sort of medical query, something similar to what might happen in a hospital, and see what happens. So nobody deauthenticate me, please. <laughs> so here, here's, I already showed you part of the rig, what we're going to do. We have the Cisco AP on the left, that's connected to a WRT 54G running open work and open VPN, creates the tunnel. And then we have the uh, attack software running on this uh, second WRT 54G. And again, if you were at our ShmooCon talk, we, we talked about the Sipinator, same software, just we gave it a different uh, MAC address uh, prefix to attack, but otherwise it's pretty much the same as what we did before. So we're gonna try this and let's hope it works. Okay, so this is a serial console into the uh, WRT54G that'll do the automated RF spoof. So we're just gonna start this up and hope it finds it. Um, it got a DHCP lease from the tunnel access point and it's looking in the address space to see if it can find any LWAP access points. Uh, and we found one. So um, it's targeting it, it's now RF spoofing it, dumping the data to local flash and then it updates, dumps that file to a remote host in the background. So,
Now you're all going to see my totally not elite AS400 skills. And this could be any sort of back-end system that's being used. And we're going to go run a SQL query here. And of course, this would, you know, in a real world, you would have some sort of nice front end. You're not generally having nurses running SQL queries, but <laughs> at least in the hospitals that I've been at. Okay, so we're going to do a very uh, efficient SQL statement here to uh, select the records that we want and not create any undue stress on our database system. So we're going to dump every record. Okay, so. This is just some fake data, of course, so I'm not actually revealing any real data. But this is really typical of what would be going on in a wireless network in a hospital, and querying back end, pulling up somebody's medical records and whatnot. So let's see if this worked. So this is a, a, a Linux box I have back home that the file's being uploaded to. Okay, so, and yes, I am using Z modem. I'm going to pull that down to my local machine. Okay. And again, this is going to look a lot like what we've seen already. Just, you know, it's this LWAP encapsulated packets. Not very exciting. I sure hope my session's in there. Okay. So we're going to. Strip this stuff out. Okay, so we got 657 packets decoded. So that's a good sign. And send the un the decoded version down here so we can take a look at what's in there. Okay. Okay, that looks a lot uh a lot more like regular. Apparently my machine was doing something there while I was doing this. Okay. Okay, so there's the TCP stream. Anybody know why I can't read that? Any any 400 people in the in the room? Yeah. What's that? Episodic. All right. If I had a prize, I'd give it to you. So the bit order is all wrong, of course. So we just switch it around. But there you go. So um, good example of you know data being leaked out from a completely HIPAA compliant facility, and that would work pretty much everywhere if you can get physical access to one of the APs, okay? Yeah? Okay, the question was um, when he's worked with some LWAP access points, it's there's been some Issues with digital certificates, uh, that's true. When you uh, work with LWAP APs, there is a digital certificate in place that's used to encrypt just the headers of the packets, but the, the payloads are not encrypted. So, so the control structure in LWAP is encrypted, but the payload is not. Okay. All right, so going back to some non-demo, more PowerPoint-ish stuff here. Um, so people are starting to notice that, that there's a problem with HIPAA, there's a problem with medical identity information leaking and, and getting out. So um, here's some information from a Harris survey. Uh, approximately 9 million Americans believe that they or a family member have had medical information lost or stolen. And 69% of those same people polled have heard of a specific incident involving medical uh, record leaking or being stolen. Uh, the graph here shows the HIPAA complaints that come into Health and Human Services for 2008. And you can see that's definitely trending up. So we talked earlier about the 59 breaches. I want to talk a little bit about some of the specifics. Um, so this map shows where those 59 breaches occurred. And you can see this is not specifically a big city problem. This is happening all over the country, you know, big cities, small towns, wherever medical information is being stored. Um, that's what makes it a little more unique than like PCI is that um, PCI you generally find that you know people who are processing credit card numbers are more concentrated in certain areas, but it turns out people everywhere need to go to the doctor. So um, this is going to happen no matter where you might be. Question? Is there any way to work on violations? Violations? 
The question was, is there any way to look up violations about a particular practitioner? I haven't found anything, but I don't know. You would think it would be public information, but I haven't seen anything on it. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. Okay. So I want to look at a couple of these and, and take a look and see what's actually been going on with these breaches. Um, this is a pretty good one. In April at the UCLA Medical Center, um, an employee was fired and then later charged for snooping through the medical records of a number of celebrities, including Britney Spears, Farrah Fawcett, and Maria Shriver. Um, there are 33 celebrities involved. They only ever released those three names. And basically, she was accused of selling that to a national media outlet. They never said who it was. Um, but coincidentally, the next day, there was an item in the National Enquirer about Farrah Fawcett's, Farrah Fawcett's cancer coming back. So you can piece that together for yourself. Um, What's interesting about this case is that she was actually charged under HIPAA uh, for accessing medical records with the intent to sell them for you know, evil doing. And that carries a pretty heavy penalty. It's uh, up to 10 years in prison and $250,000 in fines. But what's interesting is that the hospital who allowed this low level like front desk employee complete access to their database, it faced no penalties whatsoever. Question? The question was, have I seen anything where HIPAA compliance shields someone from civil litigation? Um, I haven't seen that yet, but I bet, I bet that would work. Yeah, because this is, all, this is all they're required to do under the law, so they can't really be held, unless it's like you know, they're grossly negligent or something like that. But if they're compliant, that's all the law says they have to be. So I'm going to hold these questions to the end because we're kind of running out of time, okay? Uh, here's another case. This one's kind of interesting. Um, some poor sysadmin whose job involved taking the backup tapes home because that was their disaster recovery plan, had the tapes stolen out of his minivan parked in his driveway. And it was a full backup of their ERP system, and it contained all the medical re records about uh, on 365,000 patients. Um, so that was, that was a big deal. But um, the theory is that whoever stole it was just looking to steal his laptop for drug money. And there were no incidents of this information being used inappropriately. So most likely it wasn't leaked. Um, it wasn't used for identity theft, financial, or medical. However, this is the first case where um, Health and Human Services actually fined a hospital, fined a healthcare system. And it wasn't actually a fine. They called it an agreement. And they got, uh, their agreement was to pay $100,000 and to change their policies and procedures to prevent this from happening again. Healthcare system, of course, said, did, uh, accepted no wrongdoing for this and said, well, it was an unfortunate accident. And this one is, is one of my favorites. Um, this is real medical identity theft. Um, this woman was arrested for receiving nearly $180,000 worth of medical care and prescription drugs by impersonating someone else by using her Medicare insurance cards and whatnot. Um, it was a low-level, low-tech attack. She was living with this woman at the homeless shelter and just stole her medical information out of her wallet or whatever it was. Um, but what, int what interested me in this was the amount of money this one person was able to get from one record. So if you're thinking of you know, organized crime looking for new sources of revenue, if one inept person can get $180,000 worth of Oxycontin out of one medical ID, then I think this is something that we're really going to be worried about. Um, and there's a great quote here, too. It says that, the, that she became skillful at presenting doctors with symptoms that would, lead it, that would result in prescriptions for narcotics. So she knew how to go in and you know, make them give her prescriptions for the drugs that she wanted. All right, so we're, we're rapidly running out of time here. So now what? Now what can we do to, to make this better? So I think we've pretty well established that the current rules under HIPAA are insufficient. <laughs> the breaches are still too easy, even in a HIPAA-compliant environment. We've already talked about that. Uh, the emphasis that the healthcare providers are putting is on Compliance, not on security. They're doing this because they have to, not because they want to. Okay. So obviously, there's too many addressable implementation specifics. The healthcare providers can come up with that, whatever uh, they want um, in order to meet the requirements, and they can just decide not to meet the ones that aren't even required. So there, there's a lot of play there, and uh, and they can do pretty much whatever they want when it comes to these things. Way too much emphasis on the phrase of um, reasonable and appropriate, again, giving the, the end user, the entity, healthcare provider, covered entity, um, the job of figuring out what it means for them to be compliant. 
And of course, there are not enough details in the implementation specifics. So even if encryption was required, which it's not, we don't even tell you what kind of encryption to use. Um, if you read through some of the Federal Register stuff, there's a lot of talk in there about why they didn't want to do that, that they need to be technology neutral. They don't want to specify any particular implementations. Um, they won't even go as far to say, like, what size keys you need to use if you're using, like, AES or something like that. So there's absolutely nothing in there. So, so what's happening? What's, what's happening is really interesting. We're, we're kind of coming full circle. HIPAA came in to address the fact that there was no central uh, clearinghouse of, okay, this is what it means to be secure. So HIPAA comes in place, says we're going to be, this is, you know, these are the new rules. You know, we're all HIPAA compliant, but a lot of states are realizing that that's not enough. Now they're coming up with their own laws. So we're kind of back to where we started, where it's going to be a hodgepodge. You know, if you're in California, you have a different set of requirements than if you're in another state. So um, this is just in 2007. There are over 250 uh, health information technology bills in, uh, introduced, 74 of them passed. So it's going to get even more scattered than things are now. Um, trade groups are lobbying for increased legislation. Obviously, they probably just want to sell more hardware, but they're still lobbying for it. All right, so that's my talk. Um, if anybody has any questions, we probably have like one minute now, um, and then we'll be somewhere. I don't know where we're going to be for the Q&A, but we'll take some questions. Oh, yeah, tons of them. Yeah, a lot of breaches happen at third party. Yeah, yeah, definitely smaller entities or even large entities are outsourcing their processing. And then, you know, the guy who loses the tapes happens to work for the, the third party instead of for the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, if you look through the slides, if you want to look at the, uh, the references on the page, you can actually get the full details of all the breaches that we talked about today. Uh, one. Just the, that Providence was the only one that I know about. Yeah. 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 If you look through the details, a lot of them will, the, lot of the details of the complaints, most of the resolutions say, you know, we talk to the provider and they're going to change their practice and, and they're not being fined. Uh, what, not until we told them, no. the gentleman standing up from the Oh yeah, thank you. I, I hadn't thought of checking Google. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll let Shannon take that. Okay, we're uh, getting booted out, so we're going to go over to room 106. Anybody who wants to ask us further questions or tell us they didn't like our presentation, we'll be over in room 106.